am joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined from Denver, Colorado by Matt Phillips. How are you doing, Matt? Doing well, John. Great to, great to meet you and spend some time with you today. Absolutely, yeah. And Matt is the leadership coach and the host of the Matt Phillips podcast. Uh, Matt's been helping sales leaders achieve pro-level performance by developing and harnessing their mental toughness, worked with companies like Western Union, March, uh, Marsh and Robert Half. Knows the status quo, promoting rock star salespeople to sales leaders. Yeah, that's that's always, that's the de default. Uh, yes. And then wondering why they're not rock star um, sales leaders. Uh, by combining your background as a professional baseball player with his global experience in sales, operations, and accounting, Matt supports business leaders and teams as they break through their mental roadblocks. And what we're going to talk about today is how to discover and apply your sales archetype. So we're going to get into a bit of Jungian philosophy here now in a minute. <laughs> Love it. Love it. <laughs> so, um, so, Matt, first of all, um, that point that you raised there where we get into the sales archetype, but just that point that just came up in your bio, why are we still doing that? Why are we still just taking rock star salespeople, making them sales leaders, and then wondering why like the average tenure is like 18 months and it's it's a horrible experience for them and it's a horrible experience for everybody concerned, but we still do it. We do, and I think it's that default where we, you know, in a perfect world, we think that, you know, if these individuals can be successful selling and making hopefully millions and millions of dollars, that it's an easy transition to that leadership role, right? And the, the other individuals on the team will follow suit and you know replicate what they did and how they did it and see those results. And so I think it's just that natural, that kind of yeah. hope, that vision, that dream of, of what could be if we could just replicate that one person just even one more time, right? And get people to perform just like the other individual. And the reality is that it's just a different skill set is a different mindset yeah. those individuals can absolutely be successful in making that transition it just takes a different way of approaching things yeah. and attacking things and just really making sure you you know what you're getting into and you're ready for the challenge that's ahead of you no no 100 uh okay so let's get into sales archetype so um to just explain to the audience quickly what you mean by a sales archetype just for people who may not be familiar with archetypes in general Absolutely. So we all have, the way I describe it as preferences, right? We all have different ways that we tend to show up and we're born with it. Sometimes it's developed over time, but it's just different ways that we show up to others that we work with, right? So for example, uh, some of you are familiar with all these different types of personality tests that are out there, right? The disc profile, the mm -hmm. you know, emerge genetics is insights. There's a number of them out there. And we've taken a step back and said, from a sales leader perspective, what are the four kind of critical archetypes that these individuals fall into, right? Mm -hmm. One is not better than the other right. based on your personality, based on your behaviors, the way you show up and interact with individuals. But that's really what we're here to do is help you define kind of where you sit. And it's that, you know, old, old saying that, you know, know thyself. Mm -hmm. And part of it is we have to have, if we make, as we make that transition from sales individual contributor to sales leader, we have to understand how we're showing up to others, right? Again, not good or bad, but how do we have that awareness of ourselves and others so we can get the most out of them? And and that is the big challenge, uh, Matt, isn't it? Like self-awareness, I think, is the biggest inhibitor to success, a uh, career success, personally. Um, and self-awareness is a difficult thing. It takes it, you know, it takes some investment of time and energy in your part. Uh, yes. Personally, I wish I'd have known that. Like, <laughs> I wish I'd have been self-aware a long, long time ago. But hey, you know, you get there eventually. Yes. But how do you how do you uh, uh, advise or help people to develop that self-awareness? Because sometimes people just don't know where to start. They don't. And you know, one thing that I constantly listen for in my business when I'm coaching individuals or doing workshops or the different online programs that we have is I'm listening for a lot of words and phrases that they're either saying out loud or they're not saying. And I think that's the key place to start for individuals and that self-awareness of, you know, what, what are we, what words are we speaking and what thoughts are rolling around in our head? And how do we just start writing some of those down on a piece of paper so we can start kind of putting this puzzle together, if you will, you know, not all thoughts mm -hmm. or, or words that are spoken are negative are detrimental. Absolutely not. But there are certainly ones that if we just start paying attention to, and honestly, just writing things down, because that's what I do as a coach. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm listening for what people are saying. And then I can basically 
echo that back to them so they can hear it differently. But it just starts with those types of things, right? When, when people react to you certain ways, there's a thought that you have that comes from that interaction. And starting to capture those is hands down the, the starting place. It seems very basic, but that is literally mm -hmm. the starting place for, for that self-awareness. And, and like you said, I mean, understanding that because uh, let's face it, sometimes people think that in sales, like there's a single archetype, right? You know, you want that single person, as you said, maybe it's the, the extrovert, the, the social butterfly, the people, the person who's, you know, got the gift of the gab, you know, as we'd say back yes. home and all of that. And we tend to think that that is what a salesperson is, but there's many other types. There, there are. And, you know, when we look at our four different archetypes and I, I channel my little Arnold Schwarzenegger a little bit with the Terminator, <laughs> but we've put some, some ores on the end. So we have a kind of a hardenator, visionator, numberator and procedurator, right? And so it's getting it like what really is driving those individuals and where is their kind of preference going to go first mm -hmm. when they come up against a situation. So if I'm leading a sales team and I'm dealing with some sort of situation, right? And perhaps their pipeline's not where it should be. Right. And we're trying to figure out how do we either, you know, get more into the pipeline, move it down the pipeline further, whatever it might be. But if we lead with that heart, so I'm kind of a heart guy, right? And mm -hmm. I'm a combination of these, but I lead with heart. So I want to make sure like, are you feeling okay? Are you doing all right? Like it's, it's making sure that I'm, I feel like you're taken care of before we can kind of move that needle forward. And so, recognizing that about myself where if you take a you know procedurator like right. person they're just worried about hey, here's the here's the process like we can't deviate from the process we have to follow the process so where's this and that at and with each of these archetypes it's really just that okay i know i show up that way so kind of two things one how do i make sure i'm not you know putting myself in a position where that's the only bit of analysis that i'm doing on mm -hmm. this pipeline issue that right. i'm choosing to attack it from different angles. And even probably more importantly, am I as a leader shifting my approach to meet that person where they're at, what their preference is? And that takes more energy, but that's, you know, salespeople, you're out there doing that every single day, right? It's know your customer. Yep. Yep. It's, are we doing that internally as well? Or are we just saying, we'll just do it the way I did it. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've got great success because I did it this way. Well, that may or may not work for them. You can get to the same result shifting your approach to that person. Yeah, and and no, absolutely. And what we used to say uh, back in the day when I when I ran Hathaway, which was been selling Neil Rackham's uh, research, and yes. uh, you know, as you know, he always said that the the best salespeople, most of them, have zero clue why they're good. They're unconsciously successful. They're unconsciously competent. Mm -hmm. They 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 could they could probably tell you, but it probably wouldn't even be what makes them truly successful. Um, so you know, sometimes that's the thing about you know successful mm -hmm. salespeople. Sometimes they don't even know what makes them successful, so they just say, "Well, just copy what I do," and the other person's going, well, "I don't really know what you do." <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then you look in the mirror. You look yeah. at someone. They're meditating. You're like, "Well, do I need yeah. to meditate now?" And, and, or, <laughs> Like, what do I need to do to mm -hmm. try to replicate what you do? And it, it's su that's such a key point. I think the, you know, I was talking with one of my one-on-one -on -one clients just the other day about this, and she's made this significant transition to from being a top salesperson to kind of this interim, if you will, you know, role where she had a book of business herself mm -hmm. and she was in charge right. of the team to now she's taken this EVP role and it's, you know, she's still selling, but she doesn't have a book of business she's responsible for anymore. Sure. It's really, truly developing the team. And we spent a significant amount of time one-on-one -on -one just diving into like, what, like, what made you so unique? Let's break it down. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out, because there are, you know, success leaves clues, right? We've heard that yeah, quote. Sure. And there are certain things that all, you know, great salespeople do. I, I would argue that it's a similar stuff to what great leaders do. Mm -hmm. And it's taking those concepts like the concept of consistency, right? What I see, and you probably see, have seen too, the most successful sales people yep. are unbelievably consistent. Yes. In a variety of different ways. And sometimes that's at night, it's in the morning, it's all throughout the day. The time of day can shift, but the consistency is mm -hmm. there. And so how do we take that and from a leadership perspective, make sure that I'm showing up consistent in a different way because it is different, but I'm still consistent. I'm still getting that energy, that flow. And how do we teach these individuals that are now on my team 
to have that that sense of consistency and intentionality in everything that they're doing. So you're hundred percent right. Like they they don't know, but we can dive in just like I did with this client mm -hmm. to say, oh, this this is what we're going after. Now, how do we take that? Call it. Uh, but I, by the way, was she was she surprised about some of the things as you went through this process about herself and about her own success? She was, but she wasn't. Yeah. Right. So the way she was more surprised that when we put it together into kind of this formula, if you will, mm -hmm. it was like this light bulb went off of like, oh my gosh, like not like now I understand it. And then there was this significant shift to like, now how do we take that and scale? Mm -hmm. And that's a different conversation. Yeah. Because it's a different way of just organizing account plans and attacking these and influencing the individuals and coaching up yeah. all these, you know, maybe C players or B players or A players, but how do we elevate each of them from whatever ranking they're at to that next level? Yeah. And, and the thing, um, as you mentioned, uh, again, about coaching, because I think that is so critically important. Uh, I mean, you have a, a previous uh, a background in professional baseball. I feel like a lot of people, uh, come to coaching when they first start to coach people, they default to their high school coach or something like whatever. It doesn't matter whether it was football, volleyball, whatever, you know, but it's sort of, I shouted you and tell you what to do. And then you just go do it. And then I'll tell you if you're doing it right. And I'll tell you what you need to do better, et cetera. And that's not, I mean, that might work for some, you know, in some sports or whatever, but it doesn't work in, in coaching salespeople and coaching anyone, quite frankly. Right. Actually. Well, and it, it's such an important point, John, because, you know, I have a, a small part of my business where I still work with athletes. And it's just mm -hmm. something I've been passionate about, obviously playing, you know, collegiate sports and, and professional sports. And so I work with my son's high school hockey team, for example, and it's all on the mental side and how do we build great leaders. And what I see uh, with the coaches is that same thing, which is, I always tell people it's not wrong that they're doing it that way. That's sure. just the environment they grew up in. So mm -hmm. they're, they're mimicking the environment where they probably saw success or just that's the last coach that ever mm -hmm. came across, you know, the yep. field with them or the ice or whatever playing surface. And so that's what they think is the right way. And the thing, same thing is true in sales leadership, right? Of we have all these different individuals we work for and work with, and we're trying to pick up things from them. At least I did of, oh, I like this or I don't like this. And when people make that shift from salesperson to sales leader, where we start with everyone is defining what we call their leadership philosophy. So I love mm -hmm. asking the question of, you know, what's your leadership style or philosophy or, you know, what's a great leadership book you read and how do you implement it and, and what you do? You can ask it a bunch of different ways. When I ask that question, John, 95% of cases, I get either no answer or because they, they haven't really thought about it before, mm -hmm. or I get these very cliche answers such as, well, I have an open door policy. <laughs> And, and I, I'm like, oh, okay, I get what you mean by that, but that's not unique to you, yeah, right? How do we dive in and, and take all these inputs that we have from bosses and leaders, not just a boss at a company, but mm -hmm. coaches, all these things. Yeah. How do we break that down and create something where you get excited about it and you know how you're showing up and you know what you need to do and you're setting these clear expectations for your team of this is, this is how we're going to show up and take action if we're going to achieve that ultimate goal. Yeah. It's such a critical step with that with that shift and transition. Absolutely. And it's funny, it's interesting you say that because I knew somebody who once had an open door policy, but nobody was everybody was afraid to actually go in through it. So you can have the open door policy it doesn't mean that you actually project that that's uh, yes, that, that's acceptable. Um, and one other thing here uh, is, and again, you you just touched on it there. You said earlier about consistency, and consistency is obviously so important. But as a as a sales leader, and especially if you're going to be a coach and you're going to uh, you're going to work with your people, you have to be consistent, right? One of the things that I've seen in the past is. Like a, a sales leader would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I have coaching sessions every week. You know, I coach my salespeople or whatever. Yes. Every week I have a coaching session with each of them. And then I say, how many times have you canceled that? Mm. And they say, what do you mean? I said, how many times? Well, he said, well, things come up and, busy. you know, I've had to move things around. And I said, yes. The minute you start doing that, I mean, obviously there's 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 circumstance when you have to. Oh, but generally course. speaking, if you're if you're consistently canceling that or moving it or saying, "Oh, sorry, something came up, I got to do it," the message you're sending is it's not important. It is not important to me. Therefore, it shouldn't be that important to you either. That's very true. You're 100 percent right, and I see this. I see the same thing all the time, and I always go back to 
you know, this one gentleman that I was working with a year or two ago at this point, this was a theme that came up and Mm -hmm. I asked him really kind of two questions. One is what value do you see in those meetings? Mm -hmm. And secondly, I asked him if I were to talk to your people, what would they tell me? What would they share with me? What were they looking for that Mm -hmm. now they don't get? And oftentimes it's that opportunity. And for him, it was kind of taking a step back and going and talking to his people about like, what really do you need from me? And how can I best help you? And it shifted from, you know, the leader kind of saying, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to dictate to you or tell you like, well, this is what I did. So we're going to do these meetings and do this to, Mm -hmm. I need to shift the questions that I ask. I always say that the, the quality of the leader that you become is highly correlated to the quality of questions you ask. Mm -hmm. And that's where, when we talk about these meetings, it's, yeah, I canceled a meeting. Something came up happens. We are all busy yet. The question that follows that we have to pick very wisely because if we see a repetitive behavior, we're really not asking the right question. That could be around the, the cadence of it and the timing. It could be around what we're actually talking about. It could be misaligned expectations between salesperson and sales leader. Yeah. It could be a lot of things, but it's what's the next question that we need to ask to get it like truly what's the value of the time that we're spending here. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think the other thing, it's a human nature thing as well, is uh, is this I, where we're wired, we're wired to, to find mistakes, right? We're wired to be on the lookout for people not doing exactly what we want them to do. Yes. But we're not wired to catch them doing things right. And, and I think that's another, that's just something I think we've all had to learn over time is like, take a stop for a moment. Why am I not why am I not saying, hey, listen, this is great. I just saw what you did there. That's fantastic. Why is the only time I give feedback is, hey, listen, you haven't done this or you you, you didn't do this right or whatever. And and that's a kind of that's a kind of hard wiring that we have to change. And you gotta change that if you're in a leadership position. You do. It, you know, one thing I always talk about, you know, we talk about the mental side of things, mm-hmm. right? And we have a couple of names for it. One is our we call it the one percent success psychology, right? So how do you, you know, take what you learn from the best professional athletes, the best leaders out there, there's a certain mindset that they have, right? We also mm-hmm. call it mental toughness. So there's different ways to talk about it. You could call it resiliency or just having mm-hmm. a strong mindset. Um, but it's what is so different about those individuals that makes them focus on the right things. And so part of what we always talk about, I, I always share this example, John, of, uh, I don't know how many out there of your listeners have heard of the reticular activating system before. And it's a part of the brain. It's right at the base of your brain. And it's the filter between the subconscious and conscious mind. And I won't go too far into the you know science behind this, but this RAS is the filter. And so an example I always use is that, uh, you know, I grew up with this saying here in, in Colorado that bad things happen in threes. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard that or if you, you yeah. heard that over where you grew up and, oh, yeah. uh, overseas, but bad things happen in threes. And so if I believe that to be true, then, you know, I stub my toe on a chair or something and I'm like, oh no, like, here we go. Right. There's number one. And then sure enough, here comes number two, here comes number three, and it could be big or small. And then it stops. And so, but it kind of begs the question, like, why don't bad things happen in four or five, six, I mean, name the number, right? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it's simply because that's not the belief. It's the belief that where bad things happen in sevens, your RAS, which is going through all this information that's coming in, would go find number four, five, six, and seven, and would show you that. Mm -hmm. So we have this power inside us to trigger our own brain, our RAS, to say, you know what? I tend to focus on when when the pipeline's not full or when they're not doing the activity or this or that or whatever it is. And you can literally tell your RAS to say, hey, show me the good, show me the movement, show me the opportunity, show me the, the, you know, client that I, or prospect that I'm not seeing right now, what's right in front of me and let your brain go to work. Mm. And you can do that not only for yourself, but your team. Yeah, We have this like unbelievable power within us. So I I have this, you know, great example of, I was one day, it was related to, we were hiring a new marketing firm and, you know, it's in the simplest things, John, I tell you, it's the simplest things, but I was like, I need a new marketing firm. And of course I get in my little pity party, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, of, oh, this is going to be take forever. And this is painful yeah. and blah, blah, blah. I started my little Matt Phillips pity party. And so finally, you know, 
part of learning the one percent success psychology is you learn to catch yourself quicker mm. time and time again when you start feeling like yourself like you're getting off track yeah and this is what you can teach your sales people too by the way i but i caught myself pretty quick and i said okay hold on a minute and i literally stood up in my office and as odd as this sounds i said out loud and thank goodness nobody was home <laughs> but i said raz i have to know someone who has a connection to a really good marketing firm go to work. I'm not seeing them. Right. And I sat back down and I kid you not 60 seconds later, this name pops in my head. This guy named Kelly, one of my one-on-one -on -one clients who is the CEO of an advertising company. Ah, there you go. I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> but point being, it took me to understand like my brain, the way it works to call it out, to see things differently. And that's where I mean, that's the game changer, right? We can have, and we teach the tactics and the tools of how to build your leadership philosophy and, and look at account planning like differently. We have a whole different, mm -hmm. unique approach to it. And so there's some tactical stuff that we do. And also we integrate that success psychology because that that's the true differentiator. That's what's mm -hmm. going to get you that extra 1% that gets you in front of that client, that opportunity makes you a better husband, wife. I mean, every area of life, that's the differentiator. Yeah, and they and then they they become in, in, ingrained habits after a while. Which is, absolutely. By the way, you just reminded me of that. Like my wife has has decided this this the one the one step process she has now is like if you take out something and you don't put it back exactly where it's supposed to be, if you stop and like put it on the side, and I'll, I'll do that later. She goes, no, one step. One step. <laughs> Just go the extra few feet and put it in the where it's supposed to be. Instead of <laughs> driving my wife, you. it's so funny. My wife's doing the same thing with like, like adamant. Like, yeah. if you use a dish, it goes in the dishwasher. Yeah, use a dish in the dishwasher. Yeah. It's, it's not like, a three. It's she's like it's one step. It's not a three step process. It's not bring it over and put it in the, in the in the sink. And then a while later, come by and wash it, and then eventually put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> That's hilarious. But the process document says so. I don't know what I can't deviate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, um, Matt, this is great. All of Matt's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Absolutely. So as you said at the beginning, uh, the simplest way to put it is I'm a leadership coach, right? And I come mm -hmm. along sales leaders and help them really blow up sales. So how do we start building that world-class sales team? How do we make sure we're focused on the right things that are going to move the needle for you as a leader and for your sales team? And so we're I'm very fortunate over the last 11 plus years that I've had Matt Phillips coaching to work in you know, for a number of amazing clients in a bunch of different industries and through, you know, keynote speeches, one-on-one -on -one coaching workshops, and then also our sales manager leadership program, which is an online kind of self-paced and group coaching program. We're able to do some pretty fun stuff and, and really, really see some amazing results with companies. So. Yeah. Well, I would encourage you to go check it out. Um, I'm a big believer in, uh, in coaching and finding the in finding the right resources because sometimes if you if you don't know how to coach or you you're promoting people into leadership positions or whatever go find somebody like matt who can help you because it doesn't co coaching particularly does not come naturally to most people because right, they don't right. know how to do it um leadership and we didn't get into this but leadership is becoming more challenging now we have actually five generations in the workforce which i didn't think was possible but apparently it is um so now you're not just coaching people who are of your sort of generation maybe or maybe two generations you're not kind of coaching people like four or five which is going to be a challenge yes so true <laughs> all right well listen uh, as i said go check out matt's uh, work uh, my name is john golden thank you for watching and listening and i'll see you all again soon